So tonight we're going to start, uh, you know, about principles to uh, uh, instill in young men. And um, so with that thought in mind, uh, you know, the, the Bible has a lot to say about good men and evil men. And man, that just uh, there's just you know, and, and we understand that sometimes the, the Lord uses the word men and man and mankind generically. Um, but but I want you to turn to Proverbs 2 and we're going to read a verse and we're going to launch from there. Proverbs 2. Verse 20. That thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. Lord, help us now. Lord, help us. We pray greatly in Jesus name. Amen. That thou mayest walk in the way of good men. Uh, Paul writes to Titus in Titus chapter one. And um, he's telling Titus, you know, Titus is a young pastor and he's telling him, you know, there's going to be some people that you're going to down the road, you're going to ordain and you're going to put in the ministry. And one of the things he tells them is that they need to be a lover of good men. Um, I like old books and I and I love some of the I, I love a lot of the uh, the the uh, old Puritan writers. And uh, man, those guys, they had just unbelievable insight you know, into human nature. And of course, one of the, one of the famous ones, of course, is John Bunyan. And you guys are familiar, most of you with the book he wrote, Pilgrim's Progress. If you've never read that, that, that is his classic and it is well worth the read. But um, I knew that there was uh, a book full of the works of John Bunyan. And what a lot of people don't realize is John Bunyan wrote a whole lot more than just Pilgrim's Progress. And so we, uh, my wife found an old volume of it and she ordered it for me. Man, that thing is this thick and the print is teeny weeny. I mean, it's, it's, it take a long time to get through that book. But one of the things that John Bunyan wrote was a little story called the life and death of Mr. Bad Man. And it's really amazing. Like you, 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 uh, you really get some insight. John Bunyan was an expert at really dissecting something and taking it apart. And he would often turn it into a discussion, which is what he does with Pilgrim's Progress. A whole lot of the book of Pilgrim's Progress is just discussions that take place between different characters, but it's captivating. Um, and he, the life and death of, of, of Mr. Badman is, uh, is also really, really good. And, and, and he comes to the close of Mr. Badman's life and he talks about how Mr. Badman dies. Um, you know, in, um, in the Bible, in a few places, in the book of Job and in the book of Psalms, and especially uh, like Psalm 73, um, David talks about how he would be envious against the prosperity of the wicked. He would see how often it looked like wicked men just really did well and they didn't seem to be bothered. And and uh, I had a conversation with somebody this week in a far distant place. And uh, and that was it was a Christian that loves the Lord. And they said, I don't get it. They said, you know, here here we are. We're trying to do right. And this and this and this and this and this happens. And he's and, and they said, and there's somebody else in the church that they're just evil and manipulative and, and everything just falls in their lap in a good way. You know, that is one of the mysteries, you know, of life is sometimes, sometimes it seems that way. Well, Mr. Badman comes to the end of his life. And in Psalm 73, David says that when the wicked die, that there are no bands in their death and they are not troubled like other men. And David's looking at this, at these wicked people, and he's looking at how it looks like that even in their death, everything's fine. Now, you guys know that's not always the case. And, and uh, there's, there's, there's another book that you can get a hold of called The Last Words of Saints and Sinners. Amazing book. And, um, and you've got, we, we know people that die and they're screaming, lost people as they go out in eternity. So you got that side too. 
And I, I remember being in the hospital with somebody that was terminally ill. Um, it may have been Brother Carmack, actually. Many of you remember Brother Carmack. And there were, there were, he was in a ward where there were, uh, you know, four other, three or three or four other guys in that ward. And uh, they were all elderly. And he said, yeah, I've been talking to the guy across the room. The guy across the room um, uh, went to a church that absolutely believes nothing. I mean, they believe everybody's going to get to heaven. They don't believe in hell. Um, it's just like it's beyond pathetic. And um, and so this guy across the room is dying, too. So I thought, you know, I should talk to him. So I go over and I, I try to engage him in conversation and everything's pleasant because, you know, I tried to start off on a pleasant note, try to find some common ground. You know, we get talking. And then then when we turned it to spiritual things, he was not interested. That's always been a mystery to me. Because here's a person on the verge of eternity and on the verge of a Christless eternity. And we know where that goes. We know that they open their eyes in the flames of hell immediately on their death. We know that. The Bible teaches that clearly. And yet, they're not troubled about it. And uh, John Bunyan, in the life of Mr. Badman, he describes his death and how he goes to his death just in perfect peace. And then John Bunyan says, that is one of the master deceptions of the devil. Is to take someone who's lived wicked and godless all their life and give them the most untroubled, peaceful death. He said, that is a deception of the devil so that the onlookers, the wicked onlookers will take encouragement from that and think, well, look at that. I'll be okay too. Mr. Badman. Look at Psalm 112, Psalm 112. There are good men and there are bad men. You know, I think we want our sons to be uh, good men. But you know, that's sure not going to happen by accident. Psalm 112, verse 5. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Right, go back to Proverbs. Look at Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12. Just a few verses quickly. Proverbs 12, verse 2, a good man obtaineth favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. Look at Proverbs 13, verse 22. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Look at Luke chapter 6, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke chapter 6. Luke 6, Luke 6, verse 45, Luke 6, verse 45, it says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So he says, uh, you know, uh, what comes out of that person's mouth, uh, a good man, you know, there's reason good things come out. Um, and, you know, we know anybody can stage anything. We know uh, a bad man can, you know, pretend. But, you know, it's the Lord's talking about, you know, those when you're when you're not doing that, when you're when you're just being who you are out of the abundance of the heart. Um, you know, old illustration, we've used it. Here many times, but you take a glass of milk, you fill it clear full, and lean right to the top. We could put it on a on a table here in front of us, and we could just shake the table a little bit, 
And you know what's going to come out of that glass? I mean, we got it full right to the brim. What's going to come out of it? Well, milk's going to come out of it. Um, you know, when you when you bump it, that's what's coming out. You know, um, you're not going to get Kool-Aid out of it. You're not going to get apple juice out of it. You know, you're not going to get Coke out of it. Why? Because it's full of milk. Why is it that in an unguarded moment, some of the things that come out of some people's mouth, we understand lost people are lost. We got that. But what comes out of people's mouth when they're not worried about what anybody's going to find out? And suddenly the abundance comes out. God says a good man, even if he gets bumped, what's going to come out? Something good. That's a good man. Look at Ecclesiastes 11. Ecclesiastes. And you know, the Bible gives some examples of good men. It mentions Barnabas. It mentions Joseph of Arimathea, the guy that gave his, uh, his sepulcher, his grave to the Lord Jesus. The Holy Ghost records that he was a good man and an honorable you know that's what we want. We we want our we want our, our sons. There's gonna have to be some things we're gonna have to put in them. You know we're gonna let me say it this way: we're gonna have to try to put in them. Just like you know we've been talking about our daughters. You know there's some things that and you know we're we're giving principles. We're giving things to aim at. We're giving, and you know the bottom line is we we were talking with this somebody was talking about this on Sunday, and he says what you have to do is. You, you do the very best you can. Boy, that's really subjective. And only God knows if that's true in any person's heart. You know, you see, you know, uh, I did the best I could. Well, we've all heard that sometimes, and it was pretty lame. Okay? So, but God knows. God knows if, if somebody's whole heart was in it, and you can do your best, and you can put all your heart into it, but except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain to build it. Except the Lord keep the city. The watchman waketh but in vain. So it's a twofold thing. It's us doing what we can, what we see the opportunity. It's us throwing our heart into it and making a priority and doing what the scripture says. It's that and us alone with God pleading with the Lord to bless and to work in their heart. We can gain access here. We can put stuff in here and certainly they're going to watch us here. But only the Lord can reach here. So it's a twofold thing. Look at Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9. We're talking about young men and, and putting things in young men. Hebrews 11, verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. And let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. And walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. You know, young men are, they're, they're strong. The glory of young men is their strength. And, and, um, and the wisest man that ever lived says, you know, it's, it's, it's not a problem. He says, you know, enjoy life, you know, enjoy your strength, uh, man, uh, have a good time while you can. But he says, but, you know, don't ever forget. Know thou that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. Solomon said in Proverbs 4, he says, For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words. It's interesting, Solomon's talking about his dad, and his dad was David, and his, he said, he said my, my father taught me. And, uh, you know, I think David, did, David, had his, David had his issues, didn't he? But, man, he sure did a good job. You know, uh, Solomon, when given the opportunity to choose anything he wanted, Solomon said, I remember my dad taught me. He said, son, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Man, you go down through Proverbs chapter four, all the things David said to him. And when that, when that, when God appeared to Solomon, God says, I'll give you anything you want, Solomon. 
Boy, David put something in his heart. He said, Lord, he said, if you'll give me an understanding heart. He said, that's all I'll ask. Somebody taught him that. And I mean, somebody burned it deep in his in his thinking. It says this in Titus 2. You don't have to turn there. We'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll go there um, on another day. But in Titus chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Exhort the, so, the young men to be sober-minded. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things you know um anytime you start you start going down this list and I, i've been very conscious of this you know you um you you deal with the young ladies and then you're going to deal with the young men and um and um i i don't know it's it's almost i don't know if it's it's if it's if it's uh just our humanness or what but but sometimes you'll catch yourself and people are almost keeping score and it's like Okay, he made us really feel bad. I hope he really makes the others feel bad. You know, you get this scorekeeping thing going on. Um, you know, I made a statement a couple weeks ago, and I said, uh, I said, there are some things that men gravitate to and women gravitate to. I said, there are some things, some very specific things. And um, with women, it seems to be three or four major things. But, you know, when you get to men, um, it seems like the Lord doesn't just deal with the men on three or four issues. It seems like there's a host of issues. There is a host of issues. Then all the ladies quietly said, amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> preach it. Preach it, Pastor. Let them have it. You know, men have a lot of issues. Amen. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, and, you know, some of that is human nature. And there again, some of these things that appear in one appear in the other. But but men's issues. Wow. Uh, you go through the Bible and I'm just going to run through a quick list and then I'm going to zero in on something before we go home. Man, there's lust. There's pride. There's stubbornness and unteachableness. There's slothfulness. There's abuse of authority and people. And the Bible has a word for that. The Bible calls it being oppressive. He, Solomon said, um, envy thou not the oppressor and choose none of his ways. Um, their secret sin. Uh, Ezekiel talked about uh, the Holy Ghost said, look at what the ancients of Israel are doing in the dark. Um, there is weakness. You know, you, you'd think, men, there's there's some men that are rash, and then there's others that are weak. You know, there's some men that have a public face, but they also have a private face. There's some that want peace at any price, and they'll compromise anything to get it. There's some that are controlled by somebody else that dominates them. And, uh, you know, there's there's just, uh, and that was, that was just a, a quickie, overshot and, and, and the list goes on. Um, where do we start with our young men? And, and I, I really, I guess you could start anywhere. Um, let me say this. You know what we need to teach our, our young men is, um, you know, we just prayed. We need to teach our young men that regular answered prayer. Now you, you're going to think, well, well, this is really, you're going to think, well, this is really tame. I'll just hang on for a minute. We've got to teach our young men that regular answered prayer, regular answered specific prayer must be a reality. Where else are they going to get help against temptation? Where are they going to learn to get provision? Oh, they're supposed to work hard and all that stuff. But you guys all know there's times when you're up against the wall. And as a believer, we have an unfailing resource and our God will supply our needs. But, but you know, it, 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 that only works if you're on speaking terms with God 
and and God, you can you can you, you've already developed this thing where you call and He answers. And you can say, "Oh God, God, I've worked hard, but Lord, I just got hit with this bill. God, I don't have a clue, but Lord, I know you own the cattle on a thousand hills." Answered prayer must be a reality for guidance in decision. You know, our young men, and I know they 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 perhaps won't all marry, but whether they marry or not, they still have to make decisions. But when when you you got a wife and you got some kids and you're making decisions that are affecting them, you know, it really would it really would help to have some guidance from the Lord. Answered prayer must be a reality for personal confidence. There must be a confidence in our young men that keeps them from the insecurity that will drive them to feel the need of a peer group. Or it will drive them to feel the need of acceptance. You know why a lot of uh, people do the dumb things they do and why they're influenced? You know, they, they, they just they get this insecurity thing going and they, they don't feel confident in their decisions. They don't feel confident in what the Lord said. Uh, and, and so what they do is because they don't feel confident and because they're not going to venture out in faith and because they're not used to doing that, um, um, you know, they um, they start weighing everything by how they're being accepted. And that's why, you know, they they have a few friends at church that they thought they were their friends and they sort of lose those friends. And then they meet somebody. The devil, of course, always has somebody just in the wings, just waiting. Some nice person. Well, you know, those people at church, you know, they weren't very nice to me. But, you know, those people at work or those people, you know, and, and, and all of a sudden um, uh, that's happened here at this church, by the way. And it's a little too personal for me to reveal anything. Um, but <laughs> it's wild. Somebody says, well, those church people, they just, they weren't there when I needed them. And so they don't have any confidence in God. Their security is not in God. Their security is not here. And so immediately they become prey. For the next two or three people that will come along that are sweet and kind and understanding. And they're going to give them a listening ear and they get sucked in hook, line and sinker because they have no confidence. There is a verse to me. It's one of the most. It's just, just a personal thing with me, I suppose. But Isaiah 30, 15 is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. It says. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. When a person's been in that quiet place with the Lord and they meditate and they read and they pray and there's a lot of things you just do and you just do them quietly in, in quietness and, and when they know, when they, got, when, they got it, when they got an open line between them and the Lord and they know that... If our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God? And all of a sudden, you, you don't feel, oh, oh, I've got to go over here so they'll like me. Oh, oh, well, these guys like me even better. And 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 all of a sudden you're just you're just, they're just all over the map. Because can, I, can we can you look at a couple of verses with me? Look at um, Proverbs chapter one. You know, adults are just as bad as children with this, but, you know, it, you know, they, for the longest time, you know, you always hear people talk about, you know, teenagers and, you know, and their peers and peer pressure and all that stuff. Although that, that thing exists in every, every age group, it exists all over the place. You know, we teach, need to teach our young men. Our young men need to be confident. Now, I don't mean stupid, and I'm going to talk talk about that in a minute. But they need to be confident, and, and they need to have a good confidence. Because here's this, you, you know, you, you're going to hand off one of your daughters to him, maybe. And you're going to look at this guy, and, and you're going to think, 
you know, oh, hey, he's a good guy. She's in love with this guy. And you're going to hand him off. And you know what? You know, you know, you don't want a guy that's like, uh, he's like, he's, he's looking at her like, like, you know, he's confused and he doesn't know what to do. And he's like, oh, honey, you know, I don't know what to do. Can, can you save the day? Cause I sure can't. And, and, you know, I don't know what to do. And Johnny says this, but Bobby says this and, and I don't know. And I just, I, I've watched some, I've watched some adult, I've, I've seen some adult men that couldn't make up their mind. They, good men could not make up their mind. No confidence. No confidence. Look at Proverbs 1, verse 10. My son, Solomon says. My son, he's talking to his son. If sinners entice thee, tempt thee, they make it look good, make it look like a lot of fun. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us. Let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down to the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Be one of us. Let us all have one purse, my son. Walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot. From their path. Look at Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4. Verse 13. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her for she is thy life. And by the way, this is the chapter. Chapter 4 verse 1. Hear ye children the instruction of father. Verse 3. For I was my father's son. Verse 4. He taught me also. Look at verse 13. Take fast hold of instruction, David said to Solomon. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. A really unusual verse, verse 15. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. Boy, it's four, four times in that verse, he, he just says the same thing in different. He says, man, just get, it. Just get out of there. Look at Acts 20 for a minute. Acts 20. Acts 20. Verse 30. And, and also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And, and who are these people that they, who are these people that get to follow them? Oh, they're people that, that they're not confident in what they believe. They're not secure in what they believe. And so they're looking for acceptance. And so here's this group, you know, they're starting to gather up. They got this new thing going and it's a little wacky, but you know what? Uh, they like me and, and, they, and they're, we're, we're all going to be, we're, we're, we're going to feel like we're part of this. Look at Romans 16, Romans 16. Romans 16. Romans 16, verse 17, we read these verses just recently. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and, con and, and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. You know, when a, when a young man, when a young man, um, when he's not confident, when he, and, and the same would be true of a young woman. But when a young man is not confident, um, you know what he'll do? Um, he's he's he just feel this he feels this need to fit in somewhere. You know, he, he's not confident that he can stand on his own two feet. So he's got to fit in somewhere. 
And the next thing you know, he will harden himself against truth to fit in with some group of people. And then, then what have they done? They've sold out. They've, they've sold themselves because they're, they're not, this was not, they didn't have any confidence here. Now they may say they believe this, you know, but they wind up out there in some weird thing somewhere. And, and why is that? Well, there was a whole bunch of them and uh, they were getting together and they welcomed him in. And, um, and um, he wasn't confident where he was. You know, none of us want our kids to get sucked in to some cultish group somewhere, even some cultish Baptist group. We don't want them uh, to get sucked in. You know, our young men, they, they need to be confident. They need to be able to open their Bible and look at what it says and not have to twist it and to see plainly and to be able to just confidently say, well, yeah, that's what the Bible, I know what the Bible says about that. Um. One preacher said, if you won't stand alone, you won't stand for long. And there must always be logic. There must always be teachableness. Look at Deuteronomy 21. You know, we need to pray for our young men because they're, they're going to lead these homes. At least we hope we're the, we hope they're the leader. They're going to lead these homes. And we need to pray for them that God gives them some real discernment. You know, any woman, any young woman, you know, she, she marries this guy and uh, she's marrying a Christian guy. She's marrying a guy that she, she, you know, she's not knowingly trying to walk into a disaster. So she's marrying this guy and she needs to have she needs to have confidence. She needs to look at him. You go, wow, he he knows what he's doing. And he he's a man, I, I don't I don't feel like he's gonna wind up in left field somewhere. I feel like he's got his head on straight. I feel like he's got some discernment. Well, where did he get that? He got it because somebody put it there. He's somebody gave him an example. He opened his heart to somebody that taught him, and he opened his heart to God. And there was discernment. You know, our young men need confidence. They need to know. And this sort of all goes together. They, they need to know that they can get a hold of God. They need to know that long before they're married. And they need to have that confidence that they can, they can stand. And they know where they're at. Uh, look at Deuteronomy 21, verse 18. Deuteronomy 21, verse 18. But on the other side of that is uh, something that, that um, we don't want. Um, let's look at it. Deuteronomy 21, verse 18. Boy, the wording is interesting. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gates of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put away evil from among you. And all Israel shall hear and fear. You know, um, man, there's there's got to be that confidence that comes with the relationship with God, that confidence that he knows where he's at. And um, but man, there is a big difference between confidence and stubbornness. And uh, and, and man, we we've we've got to monitor that in our sons. Um, and, and because there is a terrible male trait that arises, you know, like I said, there's a host. Men have a host of issues. But one of the issues that will arise at times is stubbornness. And uh, stubbornness is, you know, the, the first time it appears in Scripture, stubbornness was punishable by death. 
you know, it wasn't a little thing. Look at Judges chapter 2. Joshua Judges. Judges chapter 2. Stubbornness. I mean, you know what? You, you, you need to watch for this thing where, you know, well, I'm just going to be right. And I'm going to be right no matter if I'm wrong and everybody gets killed. I'm still going to be right. You say that's ridiculous. I, I've watched some people's kids. Nobody here. Uh, by the grace of God, I can honestly say that. Uh, but, I, but I saw a dear friend of mine years ago. He had some boys. And I saw one of his boys. I mean, when he was this high. He had to be right at everything he did. He was going to override all the other kids. He wasn't going to listen to nobody. And that followed him all the way. Uh, he's, he's, he's been living on the street now. He's, uh, he's been in and out of drug rehabs. Bless God, he was right. See, mom and daddy should have spotted something. See what they did? See, he, he wasn't doing anything really evil, right? No, it was terribly wrong. But nobody would deal with it. They thought, oh, that's just his personality. And you know what? That kills more kids and it ruins more parents because they go, oh, it's just his person. No, 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 no. Let's fix a problem. Judges 2, verse 16. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges. But they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord. But they did not so. And when the Lord raised up, when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned they turned back to same old, same old, and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not to watch the wording from their own doings and from their own stubborn way. Their own stubborn way. Look at Psalm 78. Well, you better make sure your kid's teachable. You know, uh, uh, and, and please remember, you know, they're, they're, they're taking a lot of their cues from us. Boy, we, we better make sure that they're not, you know, I, every once in a while, I've, I've told a couple of guys, you know, I love my dad. You guys have heard me brag on my dad. I will hug my dad neck when I get to heaven. I owe more to him for the cause of Jesus Christ than any person on earth. But my dad, you know, he, he had the blood of Adam running through his veins. And every once in a while, something would surge up in me and I would go, that's my dad. You know, uh, you you uh, just remember, always more is caught than taught. And it would be a wonderful thing as they try to be what you are, that they're catching the right thing. Practice makes permanent. You know, practice makes perfect? No. Practice makes permanent. If you're stubborn, you need to get along with God and get it fixed. Because if you don't, the monster in you is going to be propagated through your tribe. God frowns on stubbornness. Psalm 78, verse 1. And boy, males, men are famous for this. Psalm 78, verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, David said. I will utter dark sayings of old. Dark means hard to be understood. Which we have heard and known and our, well, here it is, our fathers have told us, our fathers taught us, he said. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Well, this whole thing's about something being passed on to the children from the fathers. 
that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. A generation that set not their heart aright. And whose spirit was not steadfast with God. He <clears throat> says, you know what? He said, we're, we're trying to teach them. He said, because the David says about his. He said, the prevail, one of the prevailing sins of those past generations. Had been their stubbornness. Look at 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. We are almost done. 1 Samuel 15. Yeah, one of these amazing passages of Scripture. And boy, the Bible is just amazing. The Bible does this. You know, the Bible, if you keep reading the Bible, the, the Bible actually defines its own words often, very often. And the Bible illustrates the things it talks about. And so let's look at 1 Samuel 15. And look at 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. And you see a famous verse. 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. <coughs> For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Okay? And so these words are being spoken to King Saul. King Saul is being um, rebuked for the second time, and he is, he is being told again in living color that he is going to lose the kingdom, and a man better than him is going to rise up. What happens in this story is it looks like God was actually giving Saul a second chance. And he said, Saul, he said, I want you to go and annihilate Amalek. He said, uh, he said, you know, it should have happened a long time ago. But he said, but I want you to, he said, I want you to do it. And he said, I don't want you to leave anything that breathes. He said, man, woman, children, animals. He said, I want you to annihilate them. Now, I'm just going to say something really quick. Ready? That always sounds so harsh. I wish I'd brought the article. Um, God willing, I'm going to bring an article right away. And when I read you this article, you will understand. People say, oh, how could God do that? He knew what he was doing. And so God tells Samuel, or, or, he said, tell King Saul. He says, I've already told him he's going to lose the kingdom. But I tell you what, let's, let's give him another run at this. He said, I got a really simple job. Wipe out Amalek. So Sam, uh, Saul goes in, and does Saul wipe out Amalek? You know what he does? He wipes out most of Amalek. You know, like 99% of it. But he saves, and why? Who knows what was going through his head. He saves the king of Amalek. He kills everybody else. But he saves the king with no intention of killing him. He's going to spare him. And then he spares all the animals, which God had said, I don't want anything. And God was very specific. Isn't the Lord always specific? I mean, you don't have to guess at what God says. You keep reading, you'll figure it out. And he says, man, woman, child, every animal, everything that breathes, I don't want anything left. So he saves it all. So let's look at, uh, go with me to verse 13. And Samuel, the prophet, came to Saul. And Saul said to him, now watch this. Mr. Spiritual himself, blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Then Saul said, now here's what I want you to see. Saul is dead wrong. He should have just confessed right then. But you know what he did? <clears throat> he defends himself. That's called stubbornness. What he did was he, there was no way he could defend it on any level. He had blatantly disobeyed the Lord. But he begins to defend himself. And he begins to blame shift. Okay, so, so look, at, um, look at verse 15. 
And Saul said, they, that's the people, have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel, in the next several verses, tells him, he says, you know, God was not interested in you sparing anything. Verse 22. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Look at um, look at verse 19. Samuel says, Wherefore then didst thou not <coughs> obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, Yea! This is stubbornness. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took up the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice. And you know what he does? He just he just keeps justifying himself and, and he argues. He argues with Samuel. And, um, and finally, he has to acknowledge that he was wrong. And Samuel's response is, rebellion is like witchcraft and stubbornness is like idolatry. The word stubborn comes from the same root word as stub and stiff. Okay. And it means unreasonably obstinate. It, it means no flexibility in opinion. It means it cannot be moved or persuaded by reasons. Now, you know what we do with that word? Sometimes we'll try to use it in a good way and we'll say, well, if they would just be, if they would just be stubborn in the right way. And, you know, we, we get that, you know, but, but um, in the Bible, you, the Bible use of the word stubborn is always bad. Um, there is a difference between stubbornness and standing. Do you know what the difference is? And this is what we must teach our young men. There is a vast difference between standing and stubbornness. Standing is logical and sensible and reasonable, and it thinks. It doesn't feel threatened by reasoning or by information or scripture. But stubbornness, there is no reasoning. It, it feels threatened. It is not logical. It's already decided that, you know, I, I'm going to do it this way and, uh, and, and, and my way, and I've already decided, and you're not going to change my mind, and I stubbornness. That's stubbornness. You know, Paul reasoned with the Jews, and that was the word the Bible used. He reasoned with the Jews. And here's what happened when Paul reasoned with the Jews. Some were open. And they were all the same bunch. They all had the same poison in their head. They'd been all been raised wrong. They'd all embraced all their traditions and all the goofy stuff that the rabbis had told them. And Paul comes in. And he begins to reason with them. And Paul was a master because Paul was one of them. And Paul reasons with them. And some of them were open. And they saw the reasonableness of it. And the ones on the other side that were stubborn, they got angry. And they had to silence him. <clears throat> they then began to plan how they could do away with him. And how they could murder him. I don't know if you've ever watched any uh, any of these debates or discussions play out. You know, occasionally there'll be uh, uh, these things online. And I don't even read them because it's just the same. It's a broken record, you know. But you get somebody and they'll, they'll say something. And then right away people start making comments. When people can't deal with information, they resort to name calling. We've got to teach our young men, you know, that they can put their feet down. They can stand on solid ground. 
they can, uh, but they've still got to be reasonable. They've got to be teachable. They've got to be open. They need to have some confidence and that's going to come from working. That's going to come from you teaching them. That's going to come from, you know, a lot of experiences that are going to come their way. And, um, but we've got to teach them not to be stubborn so that when them and their wife have a discussion, what if she's right? And guys, you, 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 some of you don't know me very well. Um, I despise, I mean, I, I sat in class in Bible school. I had one of my teachers and he was, he was a man basher and he was always telling us how stupid we were and always telling us, you know, how the, all the women were so much smarter. Man, I wanted to punch him in the face. <laughs> you know, I, I was hoping somebody would take him out behind the building and beat him up. He did that all the time. I, I don't have any use for anybody that, that, that does that on either side of the fence. Because on either side of that fence, it's wrong. You don't browbeat the women. You don't run them in the ground. You don't browbeat the men. You don't run them in the ground. You need to be reasonable. So you're having a discussion with your wife. And all of a sudden, you realize she's right. What do you do? <laughs> well, you don't know anything. You're just a woman. <laughs> you know what you are? You need to get on your knees and ask God to forgive you for your pride and your stubbornness. And you know what? That's what we don't want to pass on to our boys. We want our boys to be able to. And what if what if he's right? I know you all know this. Many of you men in this room have had this experience. There's many times where my wife has said something to me and I go, really? You really think that? I didn't see that. She says, yeah, that's, that's really what's going on here. And I'm going, okay. So I would just sort of tuck it away and I'd watch. And sure as the world, she was right. But there's been other times where we were having a discussion about something and, and I knew, I knew what the answer was. What did you do? I said, honey, the Bible says, and you need to read the kid. Go get it on your knees. No. You know, I just said, I said, no, honey, I, I, we, we can't do that. You know, um, be you kind one to another. You need that confidence that will let you lead. You need that confidence that before God, things are right. But you need to be reasonable. We need, we need to <coughs> teach our sons to not be stubborn. Let's pray. Lord, it's just simple truth, Father. Lord, we all have Adam's blood running through our veins. And Lord, we have a fallen nature. And God, we thank you, Lord, for saving us and for giving us that divine nature. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord. That we could teach our sons to be strong and discerning. And yet to be very gracious and reasonable. Lord, I pray for all of us, Lord. It, there's nobody that's immune. Lord, we can let our pride get in the way, and suddenly, Lord, we shift from standing to stubbornness. Lord, in Jesus' name, Lord, help us to be gracious and teachable as long as we live. Lord, may we not be stubborn, Lord. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, we'll give you just a, just a minute to talk to the Lord.
Well, the, the Lord is reasonable, isn't he? Lord, bless this truth to our lives and to our families, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I got something I want to pass out to you real quick. Uh, I'll, I'll, put these, I'll have a couple guys at the back, and I'll just explain what they are. Uh, 